give worship to the Lord today. Amen. church at the Grove. I'm so happy to see each and every one of you that is here today uh, with us. Uh, folks, I'm Pastor Ben, and uh, Pastor Ben will be leaving here in about 10 minutes at the most, all righty, in that I'll be ministering to uh, the uh, Gwen's family. That's what we refer to them as, most of us, but her sister Deborah uh, passed away recently unexpectedly, and today is when we are handling, uh, helping them to handle the memorial service. Um, but we leave you in good hands. It doesn't change the fact that something good is going to happen, amen, as you keep your appointment with Jesus Christ. Amen. If you came here to hear Pastor Ben or to see Pastor Ben, you'll be disappointed. If you come expecting to connect with Jesus Christ, amen, you'll never be disappointed. That's amen. the good thing that's going to happen, amen. is you and Jesus have an appointment, and you've brought your body, and I pray that you'll bring your mind and your heart into focus uh, during this next hour and a half or so. Amen. I'll lead you in capable hands. Justin will be speaking. Moise will be emceeing. 
Uh, bottom line is you have an appointment with the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Amen. But I am here specifically to do uh, one thing, and that is to pray for Frankie and Angel and Philomena. Amen. So if those ladies want to come forward and if you're part of their family and you want to stand behind them, uh, you may do so. Folks, the reason we're going to pray for them is that this Tuesday they will be taking a little flight. Okay, so ladies, um, the little flight will take you how long? 24 hours? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm saying actual flight time. About 24 hours in, in the air. So if you too want to go to Liberia, <laughs> you want to be prepared to be in the air oh I see that's with two layovers okay but folks yes they have the privilege of uh, of going to visit uh, their uh, native country of of Liberia and it's special to you I know it is it's not that hard for me to picture it being special it's also uh, a little risky. It's also going to be a little bit different because all things change over time. Though there'll be a lot of similarities and a lot of recollections, Philomena. Frankie. Angel, you're in for an experience. <laughs> But folks, they asked if, uh, this was several weeks ago, if, if, they, if I would pray over them. And it just happens to be this Sunday. Uh, that, uh, and, and that, so I wanted to be here to, to keep that promise. All righty. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for just a moment. Folks, after that, we turn it back over to, to worship. Um, we, we, you, you can stand or sit during the worship time as you feel comfortable, okay? Uh, but I would that you would join me in praying for these uh, folks. Uh, in praying for the pilot. I always say that's real important. <laughs> the pilot and the plane. Yes. A amen. I have a pretty good idea. You ladies are going to be on the plane. And maybe you'll be relaxed enough to take a nap. That would be nice. Right. Uh, praying that you don't get ill in, in the, with the traveling. Uh, but really, you guys, this is a pilot in, in the plane and this crew that uh, we want to make sure that we pray for. Also. But you guys, we look forward to your return. Not to hasten it too much. You're going to be gone how long? For two weeks. We'll miss you. But God goes where you go. As believers, he is in us. So wherever we go, he goes. And that's why sometimes we need to be careful where we go. We're taking the Lord with us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, my elders that are available. Amen. I would that you would get behind these folks. And these are official elders. But you guys, anyone who's mature in Christ can pray for people. Ought to pray for people. Right. Amen. Ladies, is it all right? I have this anointing oil. If I just anoint, and I'm just going to put it on your hand, okay? Um, in obedience to the word of God. Amen. Trust, safety, mercies, traveling grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So with that. Amen. Brother Justin, I'm going to ask you to do this anointing on their hands, if you would. All righty. Just out of respect, because I have a cold. I am not. I tested COVID negative. All right. I'm mindful. Right. 
Thank God. Amen. Jesus in your name. Uh, Lord, having planned this trip for a while now, Lord, this is the week. Savior, we give you thanks, Lord, that arrangements could be made, that the means available. Uh, Lord, this is a special trip, oh God, to this family. Lord, we're so thankful, dear God, that we have gotten the privilege of knowing them and sharing life, especially the Christ life, Lord, with each of them. Uh, but Lord, our hearts are with them, and uh, Lord, we desire, Lord, and express it to you right now, dear God, that you would bless them on this trip. Lord, that you would watch over them and watch over us while we're separated. Lord, until we are able to come together again. Lord, I pray, dear God, right now for whatever flight, Lord, whatever airplane, jet, Lord, they're going to be traveling on. Savior, I pray even right now, Lord, for its uh, maintenance, Lord, for any repairs that ought to be made. Savior, we lift up the pilots, the uh, crew that works on this vessel. Lord, this will be a special trip, as we know Frankie and Angel and Philomena. Savior, we pray, God, that you would grant them uh, physical health. Lord, may the motion of traveling not be at, uh, affect them adversely. Uh, Lord, may whatever foods they're exposed to, Lord, uh, just be a blessing to them. Lord, may they be able to enjoy the, the landscape of their home country, the relatives, dear God, that uh, maybe they've not seen in a long, long, long time. Lord, uh, old acquaintances. Lord, we just desire, Lord, a full, beautiful trip. Both in their going, my God, and in their coming back. So, Lord, we anoint them, oh God. Hallelujah. Your presence and your power, Lord, with Philomena, with Angel, with Frankie. Lord, bless their family that is not going. Uh, Lord, that keep them, dear God, while they're absent one from another. Lord, thank you for being so good to us. Lord, we acknowledge you're better to us than what we deserve. But we express our appreciation. All these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you guys, all righty. We're awaiting to hear a good report when you get back. Amen and amen. Oh 
redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss. My heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain this regrets when I think about it.
Yesterday when we had our ladies' Bible study, um, just knowing that Jesus sees you as an individual, just knowing that when he was at Simon's house and none of the norms of the day were offered to him, his feet weren't washed, he wasn't given a kiss, um, he wasn't anointed as a special guest. And as he reclined at the table, um, the woman who was known in the town, and she came forward knowing that these people were standing against the wall or sitting against the wall. They weren't allowed to the table. They were there to finish what was left. But yet she came prepared to give to him all that she had. So she cried at his feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair, and she anointed his feet with oil. She did everything, the customary norms that were supposed to be given to him at that time and in that culture. And when she did that, Jesus let Simon know, ladies, who's your daddy? He let Simon know, she's done everything that you were supposed to do, but you chose not to. And here she came with all she had, and she gave me the honor, the worship, the glory by whitewashing and drying his feet with her hair. That glory that she gave to Christ. And when he looked at her and said, your sins are forgiven, because you've done the right thing. You, you didn't have to. Can you imagine going into a room where you're not really, nobody cares about you. <laughs> they don't care if you're there. You just, you just stand against the wall, and I'll get to you later. 
Have you ever been treated that way where you're less than anybody else in the room and you feel it? And the one person that matters the absolute most is the one who comes to you and says, I see you. I know your hurts. I know where you've been, but now I know where you're going. And you're going with me. And I just want to share that with the ladies and the men. You can, you can accept it too. That Jesus sees you where you're at. He sees your heart. He sees your pain like nobody else. You have to be willing to release it to him. Don't hold on to it. Let him have it. Because when he takes it, he really takes it. And he frees you to do what you're meant to do. And right now, I know there's... Every, we've got so many things happening and so many different emotions going on. But know that God sees you as you are. And accept that and walk in your salvation. Because when you walk in the salvation of Christ, how free you really are. How free you really are. Thank you, Father God. Bless your name.
Welcome everyone at uh, Christ Church at the Grove. Uh, it's really wonderful to uh, have this opportunity to look out amongst each and every one of you. And uh, this is an exception, folks. Look to your left, look to your right, where people from every color can come together and worship God. This is truly what the church desires. This is the church that Christ wants. We're too much vanilla flavor, too much chocolate flavor. We want to mix it all up. That's what God wants to do. He wants to mix it all up. So I'm very happy to see the young children here. That's what God says. If you want to come to me, come to me like a child. Because that child is pure, that child is perfect. It's unconditional. It doesn't know about the filth and the dirt and the polluted mindset of the world that we live in today. And yes, we're all polluted. Whether you want to look at it or think of it, we deal in a filthy world today. But you know, we have a God who is pure, a God who is holy. You draw close to him, he'll draw close near to you. He will purify you, he'll rectify you. Matter of fact, he'll even resurrect you. So I'm very excited and I, and, and I'm, I thank God for this opportunity. I, and, and God bless the choir and entering into the presence of God. Truly, that's what you want to do when you enter in here. You want to enter into the presence of God. You want to enter into the presence of Moisel. You want to enter into the presence of Ben. You enter into God to meet with him here. If you want to be real with God, be real. He is real as you want him to be. For me, I can't survive without him. I've tried all the imitations. There's nothing like the real thing, and that's Jesus Christ. Uh, God bless the ladies' meeting. Because you have to gather you have to worship. You have to break bread. You have to speak of the goodness of God. You have to study his word. That's where God moves on your life. He loves you already because you're here breathing breath. It's already a miracle that you're standing here. If you think about the intricacy of your heart and your body, your mind, your soul, your spirit, all the cell, the molecular level, your heart, the rate, the air that you breathe, that's more than enough praise. But I'm here to tell you right now, he's got something more for you. For those who are visiting, thank you. But we're here to worship God. We're here to love God. So I thought about a scripture <laughs> that would be reflective. So give me a minute while I put my glasses on because I'm at that age where uh, I didn't have to use these. But now I have to. <laughs> so bear with me while I read the scripture. So when we want to enter into this place, we want to enter with thanksgiving and praise. So Psalms 100, I'm going to read that. A psalms for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endureth forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's why we're here today. And I challenge you, after the, the holiday season where everybody was, everybody was happy, everybody was joyous. What? Listen, folks. Christmas is every day. The greatest gift ever given is there every day. Learn to receive that. Hold on to that. 
because you get stale in life. Christmas, let it live on in you. Bless somebody. Give them a gift. I'm praying that Christ breaks out of this church and, 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 and gets outside of these four walls, truly. That's what being a disciple of Christ is, getting outside of these four walls so we can touch others' lives. Don't think that you can't do anything. You can do all things through Christ if you would just let him minister through you. So I would pray today for each and every one of you, God has a calling for you. God has a purpose for you. Love your wife, love your children, love those who would hurt you. Pray for those who would be hurtful with God. We have to represent a light in this dark world where people are selfish, self-centered, egotistical. It's all about me. We have to go out there and stand forth. That's what we're called to do. So that's what God laid on my heart. Uh, I have a few things here to read, so I won't try to take too much more time, but uh, folks, when you get an opportunity to come up here and God moves on your spirit, he will give you things that need to be said. They're not of me. They're not about me. It's all about what God wants to say and use me. I am his vessel. So here are some of the activities from our bowl. And obviously, tomorrow is Dr. Martin Luther King's day, a uh, celebration, a uh, being recognized for a man of God who uh, his perch was nonviolent. That everybody could come together. Children could walk in school together. Kids, kids could relate to people walk each other. People would know each other. People would love people for people. So we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King for his sacrifice and for all those who have aligned with him. And the struggle still goes on today, folks. There's inequality everywhere. Not only for people of color, but also for women. Women being abused and treated uh, worse than animals in some countries. We don't understand that because our filters are turned off. So, just want to thank, uh, reflect upon that. Um, Wednesday night we have Christian education, 7 o'clock. Uh, please show up. I'm sure you'll be filled with something that Pastor Ben or Justin Rivers teaching has a word of God. It, it helps in the middle of the week. Uh, save the date. Uh, the 15th, we're having that. Okay, here it is. The annual fast week will be the week of 115th. So I, th <laughs> I think we're here, folks. So uh, next week is going to be the fast, whatever you're fasting. Okay, and then we'll have a business meeting uh, the 22nd. And also, Wes, as I uh, enter into prayer, there's, there's a couple... Pray obviously for yourself, your family, and your needs, but don't be selfish. Once you're done your, your personal prayer, extend it to someone else. Uh, sister Gwen, uh, devastating losing her husband and then a sister. I've been there. I felt it. So would you pray for her and lift her up and, and Tim and Pastor Ben as he ministers? Uh, we pray for uh, Taylor. We had, I don't know if a, a lot of us remember Debbie Leo. She would come to church with us. She grew up with me and Chip and Ben, and she passed away, and her son is finally going to give her a going home service. So we'll keep her in prayer. And also, I want you to pray for my niece, Ursula. Uh, folks, there's people that have needs like kidneys. She, she needs a kidney transplant. Uh, when you just think about the fact that you can do the normal thing with your body, praise God for that today. People are hooked up machines that they have to have machines and technology to keep them alive. I've seen the machine. Uh, I don't want to get emotional, but it's a tearful thing when you see somebody has to go plug in a machine. You see the complications of their arm from being picked, pricked so much, the uh, infections that come up, the issues with the machine. Uh, it's a frightening thing, folks. Take, take your health. Don't take it for granted. Don't, don't get messed up and get it all twisted. Listen, you're blessed today that you can walk and go do the things that you can do. So she's in Florida right now to sign up to, to get on a list just to get a kidney. She drove to Florida. So I would pray that you would keep her in your prayer until God answers it. So, uh, Lord, uh, I just want to petition you and for all the names mentioned, Frankie and her family traveling. Uh, God, we're going into your presence. So I'm going to start praying. Pray uh, for your needs, pray for others, and just remember some of these names, okay? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have breath today.
We thank you for those who are gathered. We thank you for those who wish they were here and would be able. But God, we, we are just thanking you, God, for being real to us. God, for giving us the breath of life. Uh, God, for providing roof over our head and all these modern things that we have, God. Don't, us fall sh don't let us fall short, God, being caught up in the materialistic things of this world. God, we desire you for our life, our circumstances. You are the air that we breathe. So I pray a special blessing today for each and every one of us here today, for your needs, for your health, for your finances, for your relationship. Keep God front and center, the center point of your life, the center point of your reality. Wake up in the morning with a praise, in the afternoon, in the evening, before you go to bed. Think of the goodness and the greatness of God. He's deserving of it, folks. So today we pray a special blessing on Justin, uh, who's worked to bring us the sermon today, that something has put, played upon his heart. I'm sure God is speaking through him. God, give us eyes to hear. Guide a mind and a heart to focus upon what you have to give us. Fresh manna and water today. Cleanse, God, I pray, for, I pray for a cleanliness of our minds so we focus on you, that we hear from you, God, that we're not distracted. I bind you, Satan, any distractions that... God, you have a message and you have something for each and every one of us that are present today. So, Lord, have your way. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. We thank you, Lord. Uh, we're going to get ready to dismiss the nursery to the youth. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll wait a minute here and let them get out and before Justin comes up. And I'll thank all you teachers and people that do the... Uh, the learning, uh, teaching our children and providing for them, uh, and now the parents and the, the mature folks can sit here and, and get some food. So I'm finished, and uh, without ado, uh, God will just pray a blessing, and I'm excited to hear what Justin has to say and what, the, uh, what God has laid on his heart today, and we just thank you in the name of Jesus, Justin. Amen, amen. All right. Andrew, you can hear me? Everybody can hear me? All right. Jay, a Wilda Lexi. Great to see you guys. Ed, you don't have to be nervous. There isn't a... <laughs> Jay has actually been some of my vi uh, victim here before. Needed a Goliath, I believe, one time, and Jay's the biggest guy here. So. Okay, Caitlin, I got it on. All right. Creation fractals. Hopefully that sounds weird. Meant to sound kind of weird. I'm going to engage your mind first by doing some, uh, some pattern recognition. So I want you to take a look at these numbers. Tell me if, if uh, this one, I, we started easy. You should be able to, to tell me what the next number in the sequence is. Moist? Well, all right. Let's go a little bit more difficult. Eight, very good. Okay, I'm gonna step it up a notch. Ed, this is one of the ones I created and put on my board at work. And this one really frustrated this one uh, guy. He has a PhD in polymer physics. He's, he was really annoyed with this one, partly because a lot of other people that were saying that they hated or whatever, like saw it kind of easily. Couldn't figure it out. The answer is not six. I'm just going to give you another few seconds. Any takers? Huh? Eight? No. Did I hear a ten? Not ten. All right. This is a clue. Seven. Who said seven? Yay, Jeannie. Yes. Why is it seven? Very good. Number of letters in the name. Okay. So we're going to do some kind of pattern recognition in the Bible as we go along. So I wanted to just 
uh, stress your brain for a minute, get it in the right gear. Now, we're going to start from the very beginning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis 1. Unlike Pastor Ben, I did not put the words up there. And I have read the Bible in NIV. I grew up with the Bible in King James. In fact, most of the things, uh, most of the Bible verses, I think, that I have remembered, Shepherds, my shepherd, I shall not want, Psalms 23, uh, God is making this spirit clear with power and love and a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7. They're all King James because my mom is a big King James advocate and we learned the Bible in King James. So I'm going to actually read from the King James uh, here, here. So we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to go through the creation stories. Creation story. Okay, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Okay? Heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is a representation of day one. We're going to try to visually depict this. We've got the earth being sort of void and and uh, and it says God's spirit moved on the face of the deep. There's God's spirit moving on the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. If you want, you can kind of pay attention to the animations because I'll sort of clicking these as I read. That's day one. Day two. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. Something that maybe looked like that. Okay, let's look at day three. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered into one place and let dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and he gathered together, uh, sorry, and the gathering together of the waters called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after its his kind God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the third day I thought that animation already occurred it took me a while day three Go to day four. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons, days and the years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day, over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. The evening and the morning were the fourth day. That's day four. Okay. Go to day five. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open, the firmament of the heavens. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the water in the seas, and let fowl multiply on the earth. The evening and the morning were the fifth day. Okay? Got a grasp on day five? Okay, day six. And God said, 
Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created them. Okay, I'm going to stop there and not read the rest of it. You get get the idea of the, the days of creation. We tried to envision them pictorially. Day seven, God relaxes. Now I want to pause here and, and, and question, why does God want us to know the creation process? I mean, he could have just said, I made everything. And then continued the story with, say, Adam and Eve. Or he could have just said, I snapped my fingers, and, and that was creation. But he gave us some insight into how he did it. That's what I kind of want to tap into. Starting with God saying, I made heaven and I made earth. And there's almost these kind of two modes of reality that we can sort of consider. Which is like heaven being sort of spiritual meaning or say abstract principles. Where the earth is like physical expression or concrete examples. Uh, as an example, per se, a circle. Should have made a slide for this. But consider a circle. Everybody has an idea what a circle is, right? An actual true circle, a perfect circle, doesn't and cannot exist. It's kind of an abstract principle. I mean, what? I mean, we've got wheels and we've got all sorts of stuff. Which is the concrete example. Well, let me give you an example. So we, we know the outside of the circle, the length. It's, it's pi times the diameter. So if we know exactly how long the diameter of a circle, say we knew that exactly, it's exactly one. To get the circumference, we would do pi times one. But we don't know pi exactly. Pi goes on infinitely for decimals. You know it to several billion or trillion places at this point, but you don't know it exactly. Which means that if you know exactly the diameter, you can't know exactly how long the circle is, how the circumference of the circle. That's one problem. Another more physical problem is if you ever looked at the edge of a circle, and even if you could look down to the microscopic level, you would see atoms, and the atoms are shaking. The circle is never an intact circle in and of itself. A circle, a pure, perfect circle can exist. It only exists in our mind, but we leverage it all the time with wheels and math equations and very useful to conceive that a circle does exist. Okay. Why am I bringing this up? I want to take a look at the creation story again, not from a here's what it looks like perspective. Like, okay, there's firmament and the earth, and the earth is kind of like water, and just, but to try to extract some like deeper spiritual principles from it. That's what we're going to try to do. So day one, day one is darkness over the deep waters. What would, what would deep waters have meant to somebody 10,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, when, they, when Moses was writing this? Moses wouldn't have written this 10,000 years ago, but what would it have meant to the time, to the people of the time? The earliest writings that there's darkness over the deep. What does darkness in the deep mean to you? Imagine you're on a, a boat, like out in the ocean. One of my biggest fears is, and it's an irrational fear, but still I get like goosebumps when I see pictures of, of big ships' propellers. I'm kind of terrified of getting run over by a ship. Again, it's irrational because I can't envision a scenario where I would be run over by a ship but it still gives me goosebumps. But there's something about the deep water 
the, the darkness, the ambiguity in there, shark attacks, uh, stuff like this that gives us anxiety over the deep. There's like kind of disorder, chaos. Day one is a state of sort of disorder and chaos. Then God brings illumination. First step. Shed light. Shed light on the problem. If you want to solve any particular problem, say something you're facing or whatever, the first thing you need to do is identify it. How would you identify it? You would shed light on it. So the illumination process is moving us from the unknown, from the murky, deep nothingness to known. Helps, identi helps us identify the problem. How about day two? Day two, God imparts order. Hey, there's, there are important things. There's heavenly things. There's things above. The earth is below. There are gradients that are in between or whatever. But there's order. There's hierarchy. There was none of that before. It was just, it was just chaos. Anxiety disorder. Now there's some structure where God is the pinnacle. I love day three. Because day three... Animation. Day three gives us stability amongst the chaos. If the water is chaos, the land is stability. And fruit. Oh, I took out those things. Stop it. Okay, day three, stability. Day four, God provides us direction. He gives us a purpose for looking towards the heavens. They're going to help us with the times of the seasons. They're going to give us direction. Day five, we have, we see new life. It's interesting that God doesn't put, I thought about this for a long time, and it ultimately ended on new life, but there's something deeper here that God doesn't provide, when he makes life, none of this life like exists necessarily on the ground. It's not its mode of transportation like us and the other animals that crawl on the ground. He puts stuff in the sort of chaotic waters and stuff that flies above. It's not quite on the stable ground. Day six, we're created. Peace, tranquility, harmony, representation of things to come. So let's recap. Because we're going to see this pattern in the scriptures that, that we're going to dive into. So we've got day one, chaos, anxiety. There's illumination. Day two, we have an ordering, a hierarchy of things. We're going to put God first. Day three, God provides stability. Day four, provides direction. This leads to new life. It ultimately leads to tranquility and peace. The Garden of Eden, this perfect utopia. Before we dive into the scriptures, we're going to go, we're going to talk about fractals. The title was Creation Fractal. What, what the heck is a fractal? Take a look at this pyramid. There's a peculiar, a peculiar, wow, peculiar symmetry. Pyramid. The symmetry is that this little one down on the side is a identical representation of the big one. Can you see that? And this one is an identical representation of the one before it and the big one. And this one is an identical representation. And we could keep going. And if you could zoom in, this could go on forever. In a there's also, uh, if you guys want to dive into these fractals, there's this thing called the Mandelbrot set. I encourage you to, to Google this on your own. Melanie, Bill's not here. When I was thinking of Bill when I put this, but Bill would love to Google this and to watch the videos on the Mandelbrot set. Okay. Hi, Bill. Check out this Mandelbrot set. All right. But it's not just a theoretical thing. It doesn't just occur in, say, geometry or whatnot. We also see this in nature. Check this out. So this leaf 
Okay, you see the shape of the leaf? It's exactly the same. Yeah, hopefully you can see the blue. It doesn't come up. It's the same as its smaller subset. And then if we zoom in further on a piece of the smaller subset, which is in the top right, it also images the main thing. So these are fractals. This, hey, God created everything. God created this and also the mathematics that we employ. And this seems to be something foundational to that. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see something similar in the Bible. I want to read quickly, it's not as long as the Genesis story, but the Adam and Eve story, and, and you can understand as we read it, a complete dismantling of the ordering that God did. Check this out. They're in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So look, what's he doing? What's he attacking first? Direction. He's attacking day four. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall surely not die. So the woman saying, this is our stability, this one tree. And the serpent is saying, that's not the case. That's not, that's not your stability. For God doth know what in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Not only is it not the stability you think it is, there's greater stability elsewhere. And... In doing so, he's also obstructing the order of things, right? You shall be as gods. So now he's messing with day two, with God first and the ordering of things. Okay, so what does this lead to? This inevitably leads to day one. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. This is the first impartation of anxiety. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. If we mess with the ordering that God has, completely dismantle it, and not only did was it dismantled by the serpent, it was... It was dismantled chronologically, it leads us right back to day one, a state of chaos and anxiety. So this isn't the only sort of story. Let's look at, let's look at Noah, Genesis 6. I'm going to start at verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth and it grieved him at his heart. So, okay. Man had completely abandoned God and was completely wicked. Doesn't care about God's direction. Doesn't uh, find God as, as something stable. Finds earthly things as stable things. Uh, doesn't care of the ordering of God. God is dethroned in some sense. What's that lead to? And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in it, in the earth, shall die. So, yeah. So, Noah, we've got a flood state. we got a... Reversion back to day one. Let's look at another one uh, that's more, say, pointed and is like exactly a day three phenomenon. So Exodus 14. Noah. Oh, wow. Skipping.
Let's go back to Noah real quick. The story doesn't end in the flood. It gets better. It goes back through the days. So in Genesis 8, verse 4, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountain of Ararat, and the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountain seas. So what does God do after, he provi- after the flood? He provides stability again in the form of land. He separates the waters, and land comes up. Exactly what happens on, on day three. Separation of the chaos and the bringing of stability. Day five, uh, the birds are created. I don't think it's any coincidence that the first thing Noah does is sends out a bird. Kind of in line with, with God's creation story. All right. Now let's take a look at Exodus 14. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel, so 14 verse 10. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. So the place of the story we're in is in the Exodus. The children of Israel are leaving uh, Egypt, and Pharaoh's chasing them. And what do they encounter? They encounter a body of water. And this is completely a state of chaos and disorder. And what does God do? Well, the same thing he did on day three. Separates the waters and produces stable land. And they walk through unstable land. It's super cool. There's, uh, there, there's lots of these. I could continually go through. There, there's only a few more that I want to share with you. Uh, but you can find this pattern all over the place. Okay, King Saul. I'm not going to read the story. King James is difficult to read uh, in public. <laughs> That's more difficult than I anticipated. It's, uh, NIV is a lot easier. So King Saul, he's the first anointed king of Israel. Let's get some context. And he's suffering from severe depression and anxiety. It's in a large part because of the sin that he, that he had uh, committed. So he's in this state, he's in this flood state, a day one flood state. And what does God do? God provides stability in the form of David. So David is introduced to us as kind of a day three stability character. David comes in, plays the harp, and sort of soothes King Saul. The story of David and Goliath. So a very similar scenario. Goliath represents that flood state. The Israelites were in a flood state. They didn't want to go up against this guy. He's the beast. So God uses the same symbolic stability from David to come and again I think it's no coincidence that what does he use to defeat Goliath but earth itself stone itself so he puts a stone right in Goliath's forehead uh, this is kind of an aside but I think it's cool it occurred to me David has a little bit of a, a conversation with Goliath when he gets up there And he tells Goliath that he's going to cut his head off. David didn't bring a sword, which means he's going to use Goliath's sword to cut Goliath's head off, which is uh, all the more, like, crazy. Anyway, kind of getting to to the climax of this. I can think of countless examples. In fact, if you want to, I think it would be appropriate to put on the lens of creation to try to interpret any of the biblical stories. Because most of them fall apart somewhere where there's, you're not following direction, or you didn't put God where he's supposed to be, you lose your stability, and you're in a flood state. So it's easy to map that onto almost any other story. 
But Adam and Eve being the first time that we've reverted back to a day one phenomenon, we kind of were stuck in a, in a flood state as humans. And God provided the ultimate stability with Christ. And we'll read one of the most famous Bible verses of all time. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, only begotten son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, I'm gonna, I want you to think of your life in terms of different spheres, different domains. There's you. Your soul is taken care of. You believe in God. He's provided the ultimate stability We'll get back to a day seven phenomenon in heaven, a, a utopian type thing. That's taken care of. But you're still here, and you still have your own flood states. And not just that, other people's floods seem to interact with you, right? Other people's floods knock you off kilter. Then you have your family sphere which also can experience you know, floods on that level. And you've got a community-based thing. We even have a country-based thing, and I could even put the world up there. Anytime we messed with the creation hierarchy, which is uh, messing with the order of God, messing with his direction, we end up losing our stability and going back to a day one flood state. To recap, <laughs> there is chaos. That's day one. Day two, God's ordering. Hey, put God first. Day three, look, if you do day two, you're going to find some stability. But you need to move on that land. You need to operate on that stability so God provides direction. And, interestingly, he provided it in the dark. So those... Uh, those constellations, the firmament, that direction, it, came in the, it comes in the dark. Ultimately, we're going to get a new life. Ultimately, we'll have peace. But on these fractals, right? so your life is kind of a, a bit of a fractal uh, of a bigger thing, of, say, family or community or country. You're a smaller representation. The same way we see biblically, there's this patterning in day one, and then we see this pattern occur all over the place. I'll encourage you, follow this. I also encourage you just because it's, because it's cool. Anytime you're reading the Bible story, tr interpret it through a, the lens of creation like this. You'll find that it fits. It's amazing. Allow me to pray. Lord, uh, thank you for, for just this time. Uh, to be with this group of people, kind of in one mind, in one accord. Uh, help us, Lord, primarily to keep you first. And I know a lot of people in here are, are in a flood state. And if it's not uh, completely flooding their lives, maybe it's flooding their basement. Maybe it's flooding some small aspect of their life. And I know it's your intention that we move from that flood state. And so, God, I... I pray right now that the, the hearts, the minds here would be receptive to, to putting you first, to finding stability in you, to, to find direction in you, whether it's through your word, whether it's through the company of other believers, but dear God, that you would provide that direction even in the dark, seems to be where we need it most. And God, I, I thank you in advance uh, for the, the peace that you've given us and that you will give us. And I pray that this week there will be movement in the lives here from the flood state or to a day three stability, ultimately to a day seven utopia. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's it. You're dismissed.